There's no doubt that the Nigerian financial services industry has been evolving slowly in the last decade. And like any sector undergoing significant regulatory-led transformation, the industry has had its fair share of variability and challenges. The wide range of economic liberalization and deregulation measures following the adoption of a structural adjustment program resulted in the emergence of more banks and other financial intermediaries. My name is Peace Hyde and this is My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. During the period of 1892 and 1952, there was an inquiry by the colonial administration to investigate banking practice in Nigeria. The G.D. Payton report, which emanated from the inquiry, was the basis for the first banking ordinance of 1952. The ordinance was designed to ensure orderly commercial banking and to prevent the establishment of unviable banks. But when the banking system fails, who will be brave enough to take responsibility and turn things around? Our next guest was the right man for the job. Let's take a look at who he is. His Highness Mohamed Sanusi II, born Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, was born in Kanu on the 31st of July, 1961. He was crowned on the 8th of June, 2014, as the Emir of Kanu. Emir Sanusi II was a successful banker and the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. He was appointed on the 3rd of June, 2009 for a five-year term but was subsequently suspended from office by President Goodluck Jonathan on the 20th of February 2014 after exposing a 20 billion dollar fraud committed by the president's associates in the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation NNPC. In August 2009 Sunusi led the central bank to rescue Afri Bank, Intercontinental Bank, Union Bank, Oceanic Bank and FinBank by bailing them out with 400 billion naira of public money and dismissed their chief executives. The global financial intelligence magazine, The Banker, published by the Financial Times, has conferred on Sanusi the Global Award for the Central Bank Governor of the Year. Time magazine also listed Sanusi in its Time 100 list of the most influential people of 2011. In 2013, Sanusi was also awarded a special GIFA award at the third Global Islamic Finance Awards held in Dubai for his advocacy role in promoting Islamic banking and finance in Nigeria during his stint as governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. In 2011, he was also given the prestigious award of the Forbes Africa Person of the Year. You are watching My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV and today we are honoured to have joining us His Highness Mohammed Sanusi II, C.O.N. Sarkin Kainu. Thank you very much for joining us on My Worst Day, Forbes Africa TV. Thank you very much, Peace. Now, I'd like to start off first and foremost by asking, who is the Amir Sanusi II? A tough one. Um, I suppose... Um, you're not asking about my biography, having been a, a governor of central bank and a banker professionally, uh, and before then um, an academic. Uh, in terms of the role, it's um, a heritage role. Uh, the, the Kano Kingdom, as you know, has been in existence for over a thousand years, and my particular dynasty has been uh, ruling Kano for over 200 years. And uh, prior to the colonial administration and the um, post-independence um, government, uh, this institution used to be effectively the government um, of the area. And the Kano Emirate is contiguous with Kano State now, about 12 million people. Uh, the Emirate was actually much larger than what Kano State is today. There are about uh, two other Emirates, Ringiam and Dudze, that were carved out of Kano Emirate when Jigawa State was created. Uh, so it's a role that uh, basically is a religious, traditional role, but it's also one that has uh, 
a tremendous amount of influence in terms of being an advisory role to political authorities and uh, collaboration in the delivery of public services. Right. Um, now, before you took up this position, um, you had quite a focused career path in the financial sector with your first job um, starting at Icon Limited and as you rose to Group Managing Director of First Bank Nigeria. Now, could you please share with us a little bit more about that journey? Well, I came into banking uh, more or less by accident. Um, I, I had, uh, in terms of for profession, my plan as an undergraduate was always to go on for a master's and a PhD and be an academic economist. And I did um, start with postgraduate work. I did start teaching in the university. Uh, and then when it was time for a PhD uh, in 1985, uh, the government, in 1984 actually, the government of the then General Muhammadu Buhari uh, faced with exactly similar situations that we're in now when he came into office uh, had to put in a lot of exchange controls similar to what we have and one of the controls put in was um, a ban on fellowships and scholarships abroad for um, disciplines that were available in Nigerian universities and for many of us young academics the attraction of being in academia was the opportunity to go to America or the UK um, of France and do a doctorate, get that exposure. Uh, and I decided I didn't want to start a PhD in Nigerian University and applied to a bank. <laughs> and that was how I got into, into banking. Uh, and I started off as a corporate finance person because Icon was a subsidiary of Morgan Guarantee of New York and Baring Brothers and had a very strong corporate finance department. So I was in one of the issuing houses, did a number of issuing house activities. Um, Later, I was head of financial advisory services, did a lot of debt restructuring, mergers and acquisitions, um, and debt conversion, and so on. Um, and then I took time off to go to the Sudan to study Islamic law. I came back uh, to UBA and then uh, went into risk management. Uh, since I, I have never really been what you'd call an out and out commercial banker, I, I wasn't, um, yeah, I've, I've always tended to the more um, intellectual aspects, elements of banking and, and risk management at that time with, with the whole BAL2 uh, was, was the cutting edge and the most intellectual um, uh, piece of banking. And I rose to be the chief risk officer in UBA uh, from where I was invited by First Bank to be a chief risk officer as a director. And um, after four or five years, um, uh, asked to be to take on the role of the CEO. Now, when I look at um, the reach of your career um, from banking um, and now as the Emir of Kanu, um, you've had a very, very challenging journey, I'm sure, as most successful people would experience. But I must ask, what is your worst day in business so far? I think it will, it will have to go down to the moment I came to the conclusion that the money that belonged to the Nigerian people was being taken away from them uh, as governor of Central Bank. I mean, I had uh, for, for many years, uh, basically I'd, I'd expressed some concern about reserves not going up, but it never really hit me. I, I always thought there was some explanation of maybe and I, uh, the, uh, the profit sharing contracts, uh, production sharing contracts were not favorable to Nigeria, the oil companies were taking the bulk of the revenues, we were getting too little of it. Um, maybe we had all sorts of um, uh, financing arrangements with oil companies and therefore the revenues were going to pay off those debts, maybe an NPC had brought from banks and was paying off the banks. Uh, I think when I came face to face with the reality that money was actually coming in and not being remitted, that um, subsidies were being paid on a product uh, even though the, there was an existing presidential order not to pay subsidy on kerosene, um, that there were 
so-called strategic alliance agreements that had given people with absolutely no background in oil exploration the opportunity to take oil from Nigeria, ship it and keep the money. Uh, I, I was devastated and, and I had to take um, the very difficult decision of um, keep quiet, um, you know, and, and just hang on for the remaining few months I had in my term and just leave in peace uh, or speak up. Um, at the point that you uncovered this, what was going through your mind? I know that you said, okay, I could leave or I could actually face it head on. What were your fears? What were your reservations? You know, in my life, I've always um, defined myself uh, by the commitment to speak the truth to power. And, and this is not something that started in Central Bank. Anyone who knows me throughout my life knows me from there, like that from my days as a student union activist to my days as a radical academic um, to my days in banking. If you actually just Google my name, you would see all sorts of articles and all sorts of debates I've had over 30 years with different people on politics, on religion, and, and it's always been my uh, life to, to say things um, as I see them. So when I was faced with the banking crisis, I knew I had basically two options. Okay, one option is to do what the central bank had always done, um, which central banks in the world did, which is to say, let the banks fail. But you know, when a bank fails, uh, people just see that one bank has failed. What they don't see is the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who had been destroyed, who had money in those banks. Um, and these people are generally voiceless. So uh, the other option obviously was to say, look, no matter how much it costs the system, uh, we need to make the investment necessary to protect those poor people. So, so when I went to the president, I basically gave him those two options and said, you know, y y you will take the decision, but this is what I feel. And, and my, my feeling is that we should protect the poor people, but there are implications to that. I'd have to remove the management of the banks. I would have to go after the debtors, who, and these are very rich people uh, and very powerful people who would borrow billions from the banks and not paid back, um, would also need to uh, prosecute some. And he said, you know what, I agree with you. We can't allow this to continue. And he then said, do you need help? I said, I need the FCC to prosecute because I don't prosecute for uh, financial crimes because I think financial crimes have been committed. I need the police for protection of my people, for protection of the banks and, um, and, and general security. Um, I need the SSS to make sure that these uh, people who we want to try do not escape from the country. And, and that was exactly what made our interventions possible. From that moment, what actions did you proceed to take? Well, the first obviously was to remove the MDs of the banks that were in a grave situation, then put in liquidity to make sure that the banks remained afloat, uh, and then begin the process of the legislation that was set up an asset management company that would ultimately take over the toxic assets and also put in capital in the banks and prepare them for mergers and acquisitions. Um, and, and, and then prosecute any cases of um, criminal criminal activity. So th th those were basically the steps. So as you were trying to carry out this detoxifying process, what were some of the major challenges that you faced? Well, the first challenge um, was obviously the the resistance that you'd get from the system. Uh, many of the people who had borrowed money from banks were very powerful people, and the bank chief executives had become extremely powerful uh, pre-2009. Uh, they, they had strong political connections, and it was important, first of all, to confront that group. The, the second thing was going through the entire legislative process and even within the central bank there was very little understanding of what AMCON was supposed to be. What series of events led to the suspension um, from that post and how did you feel when that took place? We have in the central bank what's called the Governor's Consultative Committee. It's made up of um, all the departmental directors and the deputy governors and the governor. We used to meet once in a quarter uh, to review the economy. At several of these meetings I had complained that I was not at all uh, 
satisfied that we had understood what was happening to revenues. Okay, because some numbers didn't add up to me. Uh, so, so for example, in in 2012, average oil price was $113 a barrel. In 2013, it was $112. So just a $1 difference, and not, not much. Production in 2012 was 23, 2.3 million barrels a day. 2013 was about 2.2, so, uh, or 2.25, about 50,000 barrels a day difference. Now, yet between 2012 and 2013, government oil revenues collapsed by $10 billion. And I couldn't understand that. Why would you uh, have a situation in which without a collapse in oil price, without a collapse in oil revenue, you've got this huge, uh, in, oil, in, oil, in output, you have this huge drop in revenue. And I said, I needed to, I need, I needed, and I just like, this indirect is what are you doing? You know, uh, you can't just be reporting numbers. You, you've got to, to be more critical um, about it, we, we, because at the end of the day, my interest as central bank governor was, if we were not trapping these revenues, then uh, the stability we had achieved, and, and you will recall that we, this was a point when we had fixed the banking system, we had modernized the payment system, uh, we had set up Amcon, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and that was well on course. We had um, built up reserves, we had a stable exchange rate. We had brought inflation down to 8%, 8 percent, 8 point something percent, the lowest um, in uh, in in decades. And so the central bank had delivered 100% on its mandate. But I could see all of that being blown apart if something happened to oil price because we're not. So that th that was then the next line. How do you then protect that stability? And so the initial report I got was, well, look, um, we have been seeing a huge and increasing gap between the value of crude oil shipped from Nigeria and the amount of money paid in by NMPC. And um, the director mentioned um, a number and I said, well, okay, you know what, this is, this was, I think, I think uh, July or so in 2013. And I said, you know what, why don't you just go back to just January last year and now. You don't have to go back 10 years. Let's do a quick analysis. Just go back January last year and now. Bring out your from your records how much crude we exported and how much money we got in. And he came back with numbers that showed a difference of $49 billion. And I said, I don't believe this. Um, I got his deputy governor to look at the numbers again, to call the two directors in operations and reserve management, and they looked at the numbers and they came out with the same number. Okay, so um, <laughs> naturally I was in great shock. So um, I, th I thought the best thing was to write to the president and draw his attention to this. And, and the reason is, as a banker, I have a fiduciary responsibility. Um, uh, to uh, my customer to tell him if I think there's something wrong. So I wrote to the president and said, look, Mr. President, uh, I'm concerned that reserves are not going up and this is basically what's happening. Um, from my records, this is how much crude oil we ship, this is how much NMPC paid, there's a gap of 49 billion that needs to be explained. Uh, if this continues, uh, we're going to have a big problem if the price of oil comes down. We can't pr protect interest rates, we can't protect, we can't protect exchange rates, we can't protect reserves. We may have to tighten money in order to fight inflation, there will be unemployment, government revenues will suffer, and so all the things we're seeing today. Um, this was in August 2013. The president received the letter and did nothing. There was no reaction. There was no response to me. And there was no response to me. Uh, I saw him several times in meetings after that. He said nothing. What did you deduce from that, the silence? Well, I didn't know. Um, the, the, the only thing I know was um, a few weeks after that, the finance minister had called me to say, oh, Governor, can we do some reconciliation on all revenue numbers? And I said, um, Minister, I, I report to the President. I have written to the President. If the President wants me to sit with you and to reconsider the President would tell me. 
that I should sit with you. I'm not going to, because apparently he had passed the letter on to her, but, but there was no response to me. So um, again, I, as governor, I guarded the, jeal uh, the independence of the central bank jealously, and I didn't want a situation where um, I would be seen to be reporting to the finance minister. So if the president said, sit down and look at these numbers, fine. Anyway, so he did nothing. Uh, I heard nothing until in January or December, I don't know, of that, of two, either December 2013 or January 2014, General Obasanjo wrote this famous open letter to Jonathan. And in that letter, he now referred to the letter of the central bank governor. Um, because apparently somebody had laid their hands on that letter. And, and this, I mean, this is Nigeria, it's four months long enough for somebody to have leaked the letter to someone, uh, either from the presidency or from finance or from petroleum or from the central bank, I don't know, but the letter had gone to someone. And later, I think a few weeks ago, Governor Roti Miyamichi announced to the world that he was the one who obtained a copy of the letter and leaked it. Um, so I don't know where he got it. He didn't say where he got it. Um, anyway, after Obasan Joss letter, all hell now broke loose. And now we know just Amechi, the letter was then leaked to uh, online media and newspapers and it became public. And that was when uh, the president now said, oh, oh, got angry and then we then had to sit down and do reconciliation. When it got leaked, what was you thinking? Did you, did you anticipate that this could be the end of your position? I'll be honest with you, in my mind, I, I believed that this kind of thing could not be happening without very senior people knowing. And when, when, you, when you take a decision to, and, and before then, um, if you, if you I, I don't know whether you've seen my TEDx, uh, video. Um, I, I had talked about this. Um, I knew that taking on the NMPC was taking on the most powerful minister in Jonathan's government, and and nobody who had touched Tizani had survived. So it, it was, it was not a question of what would happen. Um, I, I I just didn't care at that time. Uh, my my, I did not want to go down in history as having seen this and kept quiet. And, and, that, and that was because, look at my role, uh, I've always said that I never saw the being governor of Central Bank as an end. It, it was never really an ambition for me. It was a job, you know, I would leave it anyway. Even if, if I wasn't sacked, my term would end anyway. And I decided I didn't want a second term because I didn't, want, I didn't have the kind of relationship with the people I was working with that made me look forward to another five years, okay? So the only reason I stayed was because I believed uh, if you're called to serve your country, or I was convinced by uh, my uncle, the, the, the previous emir, that if you ask to serve your country, you don't just walk away. You have a five-year term, complete the term, uh, and then go. Um, but in my mind, I was always ready to, to leave any time. So it wasn't an issue. Uh, the, the real issue for me was to get to the bottom of what it was. So after the first round of reconciliation, we discovered that, okay, um, there was $29 billion that was explained. And how was that explained? Uh, basically, uh, the crude that was shipped by NMPC did not entirely belong to NMPC. Okay, uh, so, so for example, um, under production sharing contracts, all companies were supposed to pay petroleum profits tax and royalty, but they paid in crude. This is to the tax agency. So NMPC was actually shipping this crude on behalf of tax agency. So the money did come into the central bank, but it came in through the account of FIRS, not the NMPC. And, and, but there was, our, our guys didn't know that working. So they worked that out, that was fine. And we, you know, frankly, for us in the central bank, 
who we wanted to have an explanation for all the 49. If, it, if we turned out to be wrong, we'd be very happy because um, no central bank governor, or no Nigerian would like to believe that there was so much money that was not accounted for. But after that 29, uh, all being said, there was no reasonable um, explanation uh, for 20. Now, part of it you could justify as a fuel subsidy, but there was, for example, if you, and you, if you look at the PwC report, the numbers keep coming up. That was a $6 billion uh, from NPDC that never came to NPC account, never came to Federation account. It's still in the PwC report. PwC asked the management of NPDC. They sent emails, they sent letters, they refused to meet them during the audit. It's in the PwC report. So that's $6 billion gone. And nobody's to date, not even in this government, nobody has come out to say they have found that $6 billion. Uh, there was uh, the billions of dollars paid as kerosene subsidy. And I had evidence that President Er Adwa had written and directed that kerosene subsidy should be stopped, that the PPRA, which is the agency that pays subsidy, had officially accepted that, and therefore NMPC had no right to pay that subsidy. And that kerosene was actually not subsidized because the price in the market was 170, 200 naira and not 50. So the fact that NMPC tells me I paid subsidy on kerosene doesn't explain anything. If they had no legal right to pay that subsidy, they've just taken away money from the Federation. And especially when I know that in reality, there was no subsidy in the market, so I know that this was just money that was being shared by people. It's like the Forex business. If I can get 200, if I can get a million dollars today at 200 Naira, I can sell at 345. That gives me 145 million naira profit for doing nothing. And the same thing happened with kerosene. You know, a, a vessel would be purchased for $30 million, sold to people for 10, and they turned around and sold for 32, 33. So who took the, who took the $23 million? You know, somebody was taking it. I can't prove it, but I know that this was a subsidy that did not exist. So, uh, so you then have this debate over whether the money was missing or just unaccounted for, you know, he, the, the, the fact was that it was illegally, illegally withheld from the Federation account. Who do you think was responsible for that? The NMPC was doing it. I mean, I, in all my documentation, um, in everything I said publicly, I placed all the blame squarely on NNPC. Now, uh, was NMPC doing this on its own? I don't think so. And, and certainly there was a supervising minister who was the chairman of the board of NMPC, who cannot just continue to claim not knowing what happened. And, and this was basically my issue. So anyway, in the middle of all this, the president calls me and says, um, and a strange meeting, um, he, I got a call and he said, I should see him at 3 p.m. And, 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 and so I turned up at 3 p.m. And, and, and the, the entire um, place was like, it had been swept. So there, there was no one apart from the security services. Eerie silence. Uh, I got in his office, it was just me and him. It's as if everybody had been asked to go. Um, and so he says to me, you know, uh, I'm, he's calling me because he's surprised that a letter I wrote to him got to Obasanjo. I said, yeah, I'm surprised too. He said, no, that, uh, that he, he's calling me because he thinks I know who gave Obasanjo the letter. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't. So well, that letter must have left, must have been given by the central bank. So, and I said, the letter was in different places. It was in the villa. It was in petroleum. It was in finance. It was in the CBN. And by the way, Obasanjo has been a president. So he's lived in this villa for eight years. Mm -hmm. And it's more likely to have sources inside this villa than inside the central bank. But of course, um, that wasn't the purpose of the meeting. And so we came to the purpose. He said, look, uh, he said he's convinced that that letter went from the central bank to Wasanjo. And I had 24 hours to find who leaked the letter or sack somebody the director who prepared the letter or my secretary or somebody in the central bank and if i didn't sack them then that was proof that i leaked the letter 
and therefore I should resign. So, of course, um, that was the purpose of the meeting. It was what was call. your opinion on that ultimatum? Well, I said to him, well, first I'm surprised that uh, I'm being asked to resign for raising an alarm over missing funds and the minister who is in charge of the portfolio has not been asked to resign. And, and, and from then I knew I'd signed my equivalent of a death warrant. If you, if you make that kind of statement, uh, that was it. And I knew. Uh, but, I, but I basically said I was not resigning. Oh, okay. And I said I, said I wouldn't. I said I, said I, I had no intention of resigning. Uh, and he said to me, and then, and then he went very angry. Once I mentioned the minister, obviously he got very angry. His, you know, his countenance changed and he said, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, you're going to leave that office. And I, I cannot continue to work with you. Uh, and either you or I would leave government. So, so he had. So I knew that I was not going to see the end of my term. It was just a matter of time. So he told me, and so I thanked him, uh, shook his hand, and left. I, I was amused that the, the concern was not so much that there was the possibility of so much corruption, but that somebody had written a letter about it, or that somebody had leaked the letter. I was concerned that even if I had leaked the letter of Basunjo. I'd be surprised that leaking the letter is a far more serious crime than leaking money. You know, so uh, I, I, I think the irony was, uh, was something that uh, was missing. Um, was there any so point at that time where you were in fear of your life? Because for someone to... You no, know, what I did was I came down and then went straight to the office of the principal secretary to the president. Right. Uh, Ambassador Hassan Tukur. And I met him with a gentleman from Kano who was the foreign minister, Ambassador Amin Wadi. And I said to him, I said to them, okay, gentlemen, I'm coming to you because I've just had a meeting with the president and there were no witnesses. And the president has threatened me. Um, and I repeated what happened in the meeting and I said to them, um, I'm telling the two of you and I'm going to tell people close to me just so that they know that if anything happens to me, it is the president. Okay. So they, they then said, no, 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 I shouldn't talk to people. And I said, I would have to tell my family. Uh, anyway, I, I, I did tell uh, the people close to me. And then through them, I think the newspapers went and picked up a story and it was then headlines. Um, even though the papers, didn't, the papers thought it was a telephone conversation, they didn't know it was a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, and, and it came out. Uh, and people talked, uh, people intervened and said to him, you, do, you can't do that. But I knew it was just a matter of time, you know, for, for this to happen. So I wasn't totally surprised. Um, the thing with doing the kind of thing um, I did is, first of all, you've got to make sure that you don't play into the hands of your enemies, okay? Uh, that you don't, either, that you don't do anything wrong. So, so, for example, when I was suspended and there were all these um, allegations that they published, it was a good thing they did because there were 38 specific and totally false allegations. And once they're false, it's easy to prove that they're false. You see, if, if they were smart, they would have just said, oh, the governor has been suspended because we have evidence of huge fraud and corruption and blah, blah and, you know, some vague allegations. And... And then I would spend the rest of my life trying to convince people that they were lying. But when you now say you did A, B, C, D, E, F, because they relied on some guy uh, who is supposed to be head of a financial reporting council who doesn't understand accounting, you know, and he wrote all these allegations that were very easy to disprove because the documents were there. So um, it was easy to then take them one by one, reply, publish a response, and that was it. To... I wasn't even asked to, but the point is, the allegations were out there. Yes. And once the allegations were out there, I was obliged to respond. They put them online, so I responded. I published in the newspapers. I took allegation one. These were the facts. These are the documents, two. And I just and, and made it and put it out there. And since then, nothing. Um, so uh, I, I don't think I was really in fear of my life. Um, I, I mean, you know, um, even if you don't like someone, uh, you, you've got to be. I mean, Jonathan was not the kind of person 
in his nature that would have someone killed. He wasn't, he wasn't that kind of leader. He didn't have that kind of, um, I don't think that, that he has, there have ever been allegations of him arranging to have someone. So, so I never really had that kind of fear, no. I don't Going so. through this process, allegations are coming out, you're refuting them. Was there any point that you had even a morsel of regret or doubt as to whether you did the right thing? No, um, because I, I have thought through all the implications of what I was going to do. Um, uh, naturally, people who are close to you come to you and say, listen, why don't you just keep quiet like everybody else? You know, you can't take on the state, you know, you... I mean, I've been told all sorts of things. I've been told I've been removed, I've been investigated, I've been put in jail. I remember uh, Ben Murray Bruce, who is now a senator, coming to me to say that uh, he had it on good authority that if I went to the Senate with my documents, I would be removed. Um, I would be investigated and I'd be imprisoned. And I said, why would I be imprisoned? And he said, well, you know, you know you've worked in government. Uh, I've worked in government. If people really want to find something on you and they come in, in the central bank, five years, if they come and look, they will find something. And I was like, well, they will find it if I've done it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can plant something, but <laughs> if I haven't done, I mean, yeah, maybe there was a mistake. Maybe it's possible somebody under me had done something I wasn't aware of. But to the best of my knowledge, in all my years in Central Bank, I had done nothing that should put me in prison. Um, however, uh, I said to him, tell the president from me that if the punishment for going to the Senate is prison. He doesn't need to go through all of that. Uh, just ask him to tell me what prison he wants me to go to and for how many years, and I'll drive myself there. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and that was the message. I said, I, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, just tell me, go to Enugu prison for four years, I'll drive myself, take care of myself for four years and come out. Why, mm. why would you be willing to go to prison? You because it's not nothing. What's a prison? Friends? It's a place. It's a place. Go and sleep. Go and sleep, eat for four years, and come out. Even though you were innocent. If that was, the, if that was the, in a manner of speaking, if that was what, if that would make any difference, yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, the message was, I'm not going to be frightened by a threat of putting me in prison. Okay, it's 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 not the end of the world. So yeah, but you don't have to fabricate uh, any. You don't even have to go through, through the process of looking for something. Mm -hmm. Just tell me to go. At this point, what was going through your mind in terms of your own future, in terms of your career? What was the next step? What did you anticipate happening? You know, um, you, you've got to deal with people's psychology. And one of the things I said to Murray Bruce is, I'm a prince. And you need to understand the psychology of princes. The, the, the best place for a prince to be is a place where he can be a hero. And at this point, I've reached a point where I cannot lose. Right. Okay? I said, if the president brings me down, I'm a hero for having been brought down while defending 20 billion belong to Nigerian people. If I bring the president down, I'm a hero for bringing him down while defending 20 billion of Nigerian people. He has no, there's no, there was no way the president was going to win this. The only way he was going to win was to sack his petroleum minister and investigate the money. If he did not do that, he would never win. So, yeah, so if the president suspends the government of Central Bank, yeah, what, what, what is that? I mean, yeah, he's the president of Nigeria. It's, it's no glory. Right. You, you, you appoint the governor, you suspend him or you sack him, yeah. What is important is if you come out in this kind of battle, you come out and it's a battle to the end. you say is your biggest learning experience from that? The one point that's constant is that if, if you're faced with a choice um, between doing what is right and what is popular, and this is really not original, this is um, 
Marcus Aurelius in his meditations. If, if, you, if you face the choice between what is right and what is popular, you must always do the right thing. If you do the right thing, you may annoy some people. Those people might be very powerful, you know, and, and, and they could make life uncomfortable for you. And they did make life uncomfortable for me for a while. But look, where's Jonathan now? <laughs> Power is transient. He's an ex-president, he's in Bielsa, nobody is about him, okay? Um, oh, where, where, are all, where are all of them? Where, where are all the people that, that people were terrified about? Where are they? They're now um, hiding, they're now being chased, um, and, and, and you know, uh, and, and the very people who said they were friends, the people who kept uh, telling them the sun shone out of their back, uh, uh, and attacking me for doing, uh, this are very people now saying all sorts of things about them. I don't talk about him anymore. There is a new president here, you know, um, uh, Buhari. He's somebody we love, respect, support. Uh, but again, as in my comments on the exchange rate policy, um, I take more pride in being able to say to a sitting president that you're wrong than saying to someone who can no longer do anything. Every, everybody can criticize Jonathan today. But I think people should learn to speak uh, at the right time. And if you, if you don't have the courage to speak when you should, then you should have the honour and dignity to keep quiet after that. I have one more question. There are a lot of young people that are starting out in business in so many different industries, and they will look up to you. Um, what you have done is phenomenal. And what would be your advice to them if they were starting in business um, in order to not even follow your footsteps, but get anywhere near your level of success? Okay, first of all, I've never been a businessman. Yes. And, and, and I think I would be uh, a total failure if I started a business, okay? I don't know how to handle money, okay? I, I, uh, I'm a banker, I handle other people's money, ah. okay? But, uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I have no idea how to make money or how to keep it or how to build wealth, you know, I, I live from it. So, so I, I never give advice on business, right? okay? But at the end of the day, um, whatever you do, uh, and this is basically my father talking to me as a young boy saying to me, Whatever you do, you must first of all ask yourself, who are you? And who are you is, how would you like the world to remember you? It could be very mundane. You, you, you could decide that you, you're a person who will not be a minute late for every appointment. And you'd be amazed that long after you're dead, if people don't remember anything about you, they remember that you're never late for an appointment. Okay? Um, so, uh, for me, I, I have defined myself as someone who makes it his responsibility to speak truth to powerful people. And that's what I've been all my life. And that's about all that I'm going to be remembered for. When people, I mean, I, I even I look at my central bank years, I look at everything I've done in terms of fixing the banks, in terms of cashless Nigeria, in terms of low inflation, in terms of exchange rates, in terms, what do people talk about? My $20 billion letter, which is really nothing. It was not central banking, you know? Or, I mean, and it, it, it's sad in a sense, you know, uh, given how successful we were as a central bank and all the awards and all that, but all that people remember was that moment uh, with Jonathan. And, um, and or, the moment I fired bank CEOs. It was always, for me, it's always that engagement with power mm -hmm. that, defines, uh, that defines me. It's not how much money you make, okay? So if, if you're in business and you decide that you want your business to be, to make a social impact, and that's what you want to do, or you, or you, want, your, uh, you, you want to run business on the basis of a certain ethical framework, you know, or you want to target a particular social problem, say, empower women, for example. Um, I, I think whatever you do, if you're divorced from a core value and a value horizon, uh, it's meaningless. If you make a lot of money and all it does is gives, it gives you a big house, it gives you a yacht, it gives you a jet. Yeah, so that's what you own. It's not who you are. And, and, and that's really the, the, the joy of life. It's not the, the result, it's not how much money you make, but how do you do it? 
Thank you. Thank you so much for this interview. You are absolutely phenomenal, Amir Mohammed Sanusi II. I am absolutely blown away. Um, thank you very much for joining us on My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. Uh, thank you. Uh, my friends have been trying to teach me humility. I don't think you're good for me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, let's find out what his closest allies had to say about this amazing, inspirational guest. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanu rajim. Bismillahi rahmanu rahim. Wa sallallahu ala nabi al karim. My name is uh, Aminu Ado Bayero Wambang of Kano and District Head of Kano Municipal. Hi, my name is Shahida Senusi. I'm the daughter of the Emir of Kano. My name is Olawale Adun, very, uh, very, very good friends, family friends of uh, His Highness the Emir of Kano, Mohammed Sanusi II. It's really hard for me to think about him as just an Emir because... What I would say about him is, he is... I mean, obviously, he's my father. He's a man of tremendous wit and humor. A humble leader. He's one of our finest minds. He's somebody who is one of our most competent professionals. He's the kind of leader who cares. He's a scholar. He's a philosopher. But to be honest, I think if I'm going to talk about him in two, well, like in two ways, I'd say that first of all, he wants is his people to take front seats in activities that will bring progress to their life and to the society. A man of integrity, because as far as I can think back, my father has always asked me to do the right thing and he has always done the right thing. He never really cared about the consequences when he came to doing the right thing. And He often seems to be controversial because he's willing to make a stand. He's willing to take a position and then it's for others to say whether they agree or disagree with him. My father has always been the kind of person that cares about giving back. As a father, he never really asked us to do anything in particular with our lives, but then he always said, no matter what you're going to do, just make sure that it's going to benefit your people. He's the kind of leader who cares much about his people, about the society he's leading, and uh, at a larger level, the country in general. I think he's a man of his word. But at the same time, he's a, he's a great family man. I think he made it easy for people to talk to him. And not just that, he's, he's not just a leader, like a figure, but then, you know, every day I hear about different people coming for different cases, not just family members, but then people from villages will come all the way to bring maybe like family issues or property or anything, you know, to him and he sits down with people and they judge the cases and... He's a great person to have as a friend and I think for the country as a whole, he's one of our uh, jewels who can, um, for years to come, contribute tremendously to the development of the society as a whole. Just talking about how just I think he is because I've never seen one particular person come to him to tell him something without him bringing the other party. And I think that has inspired me a lot in terms of, you know, like just thinking about the world and just knowing that no matter how close you are to a person, they might not necessarily be the right person, you know? Like, he doesn't just take sides. <laughs> um, yeah. What I will say is I pray we'll have people like him in leadership positions that will be always there for the people, that will always be there for the country, and will come out and say the truth no matter how bitter it is. There's an old saying that a good reputation is far more valuable than riches. In a world of extreme ostentatious wealth, sometimes the challenge for an entrepreneur is simply doing the right thing when everyone around them is looking for a quick get rich scheme. Do you have what it takes to keep your head above waters and still maintain your values? My name is Peace Hyde and this is My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV.